I studied at Code since uh, 2018, started with Sonda together. And we, yeah, we've like just two, like four weeks ago, we founded a company called Sustain. And this is all the result of these two years um, of working and, and working on this topic. So I'm excited to share this with you also later. And but first, we're going to dive in more in a, on a more general approach. So <clears throat> this is the agenda that I would uh, go and go forward with. So I will talk a bit about more uh, urban gardening and indoor farming. Then our story, I'll give you a little demo of what we are working on. And then we have some time of Q and A. Um, I would use, I would love to have a little um, breakout. Maybe if someone of you wants to share why they're here today and what they are interested in about, so maybe you can adjust the topic a bit uh, to your needs. If someone wants to share uh, the thoughts right now, if not, is also fine. Then I'll just move on. Good, yeah, all right. Then <laughs> I'll go on. <laughs> and yeah, if you have questions, just let me know and uh, can also interrupt me uh, during the talk if you want. All right, so $1.25 billion, that is a number. And that is actually the number of dollars that have been invested in indoor farming companies over the last years. So on the top uh, left, you can see Ironox with super robotic indoor farms, right? Um, also on the left, you see plenty, uh, 300 million in funding in farm, which is also currently available in Berlin. They focus on indoor farming in supermarkets. And on the bottom right, you see <clears throat> Gotham Greens. They do basically greenhouses on top of buildings uh, throughout uh, the United States. And so <clears throat> these are, yeah, companies that have been found, uh, that have been funded. And to understand really why there is so much interest in the, in the last years, I think it's important to first have a little bit, a deep dive into the problem uh, of the food system we face today and the challenges and trends. So <clears throat> as you probably know, there is this beautiful study that people heard a lot of times already there's population growth, right? UN says that we have two more billion people on the planet by 2050, so about 10 billion people. Then we have a trend to urbanization. So around 68% will move or live in cities. This is 20% more than we have uh, today. And 70% of our fresh water is already used by agriculture today. So the entire fresh water we have, 70% of that is used by agriculture. And one third of the arable land is also already used by agriculture. Um, so there's just uh, the fact that we have limited space of where we can grow stuff. And also the topics of monoculture, over fertilization, biodiversity loss play a huge role. So over the last years, a lot of land has been lost because there is just a lot of erosion happening. So the land is just not usable anymore to grow stuff. Um, and for example, there is 6,000 crops that are mainly used for, for food production, but only nine produce up to 66% 60, uh, 60 of the food we have. So nine of the crops worldwide produce 6% of the food we have. And that causes a lot of other different factors uh, to happen. And so the easy answer that everyone understands is, yeah, of course, we need a sustainable food system. <laughs> to uh, solve the problem, right? <laughs> and what I, so I did a lot of research and what I, what I read and what also other people say is that there is basically three big approaches, like it depends on what papers you read, but I organized them in, in these three categories, which is to reduce food waste and food loss, uh, be generally more efficient, so produce more with less, and interestingly, also switch to a more plant-based diet. And I would like to go a bit deeper into each of these topics now. <clears throat> so if we look at reducing food loss and waste, so food loss is everything that happens until the retail stage and food waste is really everything from the research uh, retail stage to the consumer and everything at the end. And 
So we waste about 1.4 billion tons every year which would be enough to already feed the 2 billion people that we're expecting until 2050. Problem solved, right? And <laughs> unfortunately not, because uh, food waste is really a... Um, so there is a new study coming out also from... that came out from uh, the UN, and they the biggest problem is actually that we can't tell how much things are being wasted. So these numbers are constantly updated as well, and. There needs to be technology to even track what we waste. So that's the first uh, category. And the second category is really that food waste in itself is super um, detailed as a, as a problem to solve. So it really depends on, on the country you're in, on the stage of food production you're in, if you're looking at, and also on the types of crops you're looking at. So for example, if we look at fish in, developed, in a developing country, a big problem is the cooling chain, because if the cooling chain breaks, the fish is wasted. Um, these problems have been solved in industrialized countries, but then the problem is more on, on norms that we throw away uh, cucumbers that are not straight or whatever, and um, we like buy too much and just let it waste in the after we bought it, right? So depending on the country, depending on the type of crop, on the product you're looking at, this the, the dynamics change. And that's also why it's super um, hard and difficult to, to weigh to, to solve that problem on a big scale because it's super puzzled. And of course, everything that we produce is basically a burden that we put on economy and on the environment um, if we don't eat it, if you don't use it. So there's an econo economic cost and of course an environmental cost if we have a lot of food waste happening um, and for me like a solution uh, or like a where i would look more deeply in is really on how to um so in, in germany or europe right where you can uh, so the, the the step where from from the farm to the production or to the uh, retail so we're looking at the farmers why they waste things and whether you can take some of the crops from the fields that are not even taken out of the field right now and, and do something with that. So it would be, if I didn't have a project, I would look into that. <laughs> the other sector is uh, plant-based diet, right? So this is really a lot about resource uh, efficiency, right? If we look at greenhouse gases, like the sectors of greenhouse gas, we see that 24% is coming from um, agricultural use and forest, forestry and, and land use. And for example, transportation only has 14%, right? And then within that sector, so within agriculture, we can see that meat has 65% of greenhouse gas emissions and diary 18%, which gives us about 75% uh, of animal farming, like 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions from food production comes from animal farming. So that's that's that, right? So if we're like looking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that would be one thing. But also if we look at the land use in agriculture, it's also quite disproportionate. So 50% of the habitable land is used for agriculture right now. And of that agricultural land, 70% is used by livestock for, for livestock for animal farming but animal farming is only responsible for 80 percent of the global color calories and 70 percent 30 percent of global protein supply right and crops that only make up 23 percent of the of the land used are actually uh, responsible for most of the calories and protein that we consume so just looking at that like i'm not i'm not a vegan myself but i try to reduce uh, animal products because of that, because it, the animal products are just have a really bad over, uh, return from input and output, right? And of course, the last one, why we're all here, <laughs> is produce more with less. And there's also, in, in that category, there's really a lot of different things. It could be precision farming, trying to use less fertilizer on the field, but one of the big areas is, of course, indoor farming. Uh, why indoor farming? Because so indoor farming uses 95% less water, is 
nutritionally much better because the plants are produced locally. So the, the time from farm to fork is really shortened down. We use 70% uh, less fertilizer and no pesticides because it's usually a controlled environment that we're growing the plants in. 99% less space because you can stack the plants in layers, sort of like, um, like skyscrapers where we put people in and you're seasonally independent, right? So a lot of the growing startups in that field, they focus on crops like strawberries or basil and because they can get a higher price for these crops in the winter time and, and the quality stays consistent throughout the year. And of course, generally faster growth because you can monitor um, the environment as well. And so the underlying technology behind indoor farming is called hydroponics. There's also different variations of hydroponics, but the general idea is that you have a nutrient solution that is with a so water with a nutrient solution. And it's a closed system where this is being circulated. And the plants, they sit in a growing medium and the roots are just, as you see on the right picture, it's our plants that we use in our system. Um, they sit in the water and the, the roots are just in the water and take up everything they need. And then depending on what kind of system you're looking at, you also have LEDs um, that provide the light of the, for the plants. And also mostly the big indoor farms, they use uh, intensive softwares and sensors to monitor the farm and to make sure that they have the perfect uh, growing conditions. <clears throat> so yeah, these are sort of the two big categories that we can see or find today. On the left, you see these big large scale indoor farms. Uh, as mentioned before, this is also where most of the investment happens. And their business model is really to sell the product. So really to sell the plant, to sell the strawberries, to sell the basil. Um, and they're really trimmed on efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. So they try to get the highest yield with the, little, the, the least input and the least cost, of course. And then we have these smart gardens for the home. As you can see on the right, this smiling person taking care of his uh, herbs. And, and this business model is very different. So there is less technology involved, less software involved. And it's really more about selling the, 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 the product. So selling the, the, the farm itself. And then efficiency is not so much a, um, a goal anymore. It's just, it needs to look nice. There need, needs to taste good, right? It needs to be like something hip that you can show off to your friends. And so these are basically the two main categories that we can find uh, today. And now you're like, hey, but isn't there like another category missing? The office farms? Right, okay. <laughs> so what I would like to do now is uh, to show and talk a little bit about the story of what we, are, what we have been working on. The story of Sustain and how it all started. Do you have questions so far or should I, should I continue? Good, all right. Okay, so it was me in 2018 <laughs> before I uh, actually exactly one month before I joined code <clears throat> and I decided to visit about 16 projects 16 urban gardening and indoor farming projects in England. Now you might be asking like why the hell England um, because I watched a TED talk um, of incredible edible top model. And Todmorden is a small uh, town, like an hour from Manchester, where this big arrow points to. And, <laughs> and Todmorden, they got really famous with a indoor, like an urban gardening concept. And now they have around 600 projects around the world that follow the same concept. And I was really interested in how they pulled it off and why it's so special. And, and England seemed like, a, and because it start, was started in England, most of these projects are also in England in different cities. And I explored basically how, what they're different, why, why, what people get out of it. And, and I also looked at some indoor farms along the way. So here are some impressions. This is in front of the police station in Todmorden. They grow some lettuce there. They had artichokes, they had um, corn as well, right? In front of the police station, that's pretty cool. And they, the police officers took care of that, right? <laughs> uh, 
Um, this is um, like a general urban garden place from Incredible Edible, like right next to the street. And on the very left, you can see a, a project where they uh, supported people to use their front yard. They didn't have a backyard, they had just a front yard to grow on, like to grow stuff in their front yard. And then here, my one of my most favorite projects from that trip is a rooftop garden from the University of Leeds. And they had one gardener that was, um, yeah, responsible for that garden. They got, he, he, she got paid for that. And then students could join in and like help do the gardening work. And you can see there's a real soil used in that example, right? So that has nothing to do with indoor farming in that sense. And every week they harvested the lettuce and they sold it downstairs in the shop, in the university shop that they had. And when I was there, this entire um, rooftop that you can see now where all these bags are laying around, when I was there for two days, they expanded that and like got rid of all these bags and put these little um, boxes that you can see. The money that they make from selling lettuce. More efficient. I'm always not sure if it's me or if it's the other people in the Zoom call, because <laughs> I also have bad are Wi-Fi. We, we, am I back? You're, I think now you are. Uh, all right. No, it looks, I see some good. people moving again. Yeah, OK. <clears throat> <laughs> so yeah, they tried to make money with selling the lettuce and basically paying the trained horticulturalist to take care of the garden. But what I liked a lot is that students could just join in and help and sort of get a free, you know, have, have a place where they can just leave their mind with non-study things and be on the fresh air. Maybe something to consider for code. <laughs> All right. And then, <clears throat> so the takeaways from that trip, what I really learned and what I didn't um, understand back then because in the TED talk they said hey we feed cities with these urban gardens right I was like can how 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 much do they actually feed the city and the people and I realized these urban gardens are unfortunately more about community building and about just creating a better uh, life in the city with yeah with better communities but really producing food where is less of a, a thing right because as the example of Leeds showed, it's really taking a lot of effort to, um, to be able to make it viable to actually pay someone with the products that you produce. And even indoor farms are struggling with that sometimes. And they are really trimmed for only, only uh, efficiency, as you see in the right, right? So they, they base indoor farming companies, they pluck out the, pub, the public, they, they, like, they don't care about community. They're just really trying to sell the product and make a profit. And whereas urban gardens, actually, they don't care if something grows. Like a lot of people that were there, they were just wanting to dig something and have see the plant grow. And if someone took the, the, the artichoke that they planted and they're like, okay, the person needed it, I'm, I'm fine. You know, like I'm, I'm doing this for fun and for community. So these two things um, I took with me and then joined code. And I essentially, it was back then we had the Green Campus project. So not an official code project, but also not really a personal side project without any support. It was sort of in between an official project and an unofficial project. And I just wanted to build a hydroponics farm. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was no plan on building something uh, great or something like that. I just wanted to try it out. Um, and yeah, I found some amazing people that, that joined me on that. And we built this beautiful prototypes, as you can see. On the left, you have a just pipes we bought from the from the store, construction store, and put the, put it together, put some lights on it. And then the next version was a more advanced one. We we got feedback that it's like too loud, the water is running all the time. And then this one was a version where the water didn't run all the time, but yeah, and it was 3D printed as well. And actually I built with the 
pipes that we didn't use for a year, I built a little farm at home for myself. <laughs> so it does work, but we just switched it. <clears throat> and then over the summer, um, I did some research with a few friends and we figured out, hey, there's actually a different problem we could solve with indoor farms. And we also had a different rebranding, but all this effort is now known as sustain and previously was known as Rova. Uh, so as you can see, like there were different people involved in different projects and um, and yeah, that's what that's what we are now. And this is our team. We are Emil, Hannes and Greta and me. And we are on the mission to accelerate the transition into a sustainable food future. So essentially what I told you with these three um, approaches and with sustain, we are like really trying to focus on the produce more with less area. And yeah, but of course, a sustainable food future, as I said, like it, it just, it's not just like office farms is not the solution, right? It's like, we really need a broad range of solutions to, to get there. But that's why also I, I don't just talk about us. I really want to paint the other problems we need to fix and other solutions we might uh, be able to, to come up with uh, to get there. So it's really like a community effort to, to, to do that. And so from our research, we got an actionable problem, which is people want more green in the office, want more plants, and they hadn't had so many healthy lunch options at work. And so what is better than a indoor farm that solves the problem? Um, so yeah, 90% wanted more green in the office and 44% bring their own lunch. So because lettuce itself is not really making you, you know, it's not making you, uh, it doesn't fill you up really, but a fresh lettuce as a side dish to your noodles or pasta, whatever you bring, uh, sounded like a good idea. And so this is what we have today. So this is a picture taken from code um, really recently, just I think two weeks ago. And <clears throat> let's watch a video because I'm currently not at code to show it in real life. How much time we have? Yeah, that should be fine. Let me know if you can hear it. Hi, welcome to our sustain farm overview. This is our office farm and I will walk you through the different parts of the farm so that you have a better understanding of what's going on. We have the screen where you will harvest and plan from and also see some statistics. So whenever you want to interact with the farm, you use the screen. <laughs> Next up, we have our seed holder. Here you can find all the seeds with the different types of lettuce and plants that we are planting. If you pull on here, you'll find the seed holder that's important and sticking it right out of here. Then we have the different modules. As you can see, we have six different modules, also with the numbers indicating which modules has what number. Our water over here, if you want to refill the water, that's only for people that manage the farm. We do that here and also the nutrients go here. And when you harvest a plant, you put the used plant pot here. So you, you take the, the pot, you take the pot and just slide it in like this. And then someone else will take care of that. And then for the geeks, all the electronics you'll find in the box below here. Right now we have four modules that you can plant lettuce. That's for you. And we also have some experimental herb types that are that you can use, but really make sure that all the plants that you take are look great and that you don't take too much of each plant. See you next. All right. So this is the one part number one. And I can also Hi. show you. Um, Hi, welcome to our sustain. The next screen, <laughs> which uh, walks you through the exact process of how to plant something. I think that takes a lot of uh, talking away if I just show you that video as well. Right, again, this is our office farm. Let's have a closer look on how to plant a new plant. Again, you can use the screen and it will walk you through the process. 
Let's click start farming now. And this time we click start planting. You can again choose what available plant type you want to plant. Let's go again for the NECA giant. And again, it will say that you will plant in this module. And you can see the instructions on how to do that on the next screen. Now, get the seed from the seed dispenser, which is this piece here. We take a necker giant, this is what we have. And then get the pot from the pot dispenser. This is right here. Now we put the seed into the pot, just like that. And we click next on the screen. Now it tells us to move the plants. Because previously we have said something, now there's space for the new plant. So we move the plant, be careful with the leaves. And then just take that and put it in the module. And then you can confirm that you actually planted it. And that's how you plant. Right. <clears throat> right. <laughs> so <laughs> what you just saw is uh, basically the overview of uh, how the product looks like and how you can plant. And you're asking, sorry, what I, I can plan? That's great. So it's really, um, the focus is, so we try to bring together this efficiency of an indoor farm and also this beautiful aspect of community from the community gardens that I, that I saw in, in, in England. And so it's an indoor farm. It works, has hydroponics and has lights and has a nutrient solution and all that. And is efficient in growing the food. Um, but it also allows everyone in the office, so every employee, to harvest and to plant their own plants. And the special uh, or like our unique selling point, if you if you will, uh, is really that we manage the farm for the employees and for the office. So you could, of course, just buy lettuce or just buy these smart gardens from from that are focused on the home and just put them in the office. But if you do that, then you have to wait six weeks until the lettuce is ready. And then the people harvest the lettuce and then can wait again six weeks until the, the lettuce is ready. Such a great concept, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> but what we, what we do differently is we schedule the plant growth so that people can harvest they need to plant something every week and therefore they can also harvest something every week. So in the planting video, you saw that you had to move the plants and that's because, uh, yeah, the plants have different uh, stages of growth and therefore you can, um, yeah, like plant and harvest something every week. And that's also something where like employees can have a nice break and interact and, and share, share the story. At least that's where they, uh, that's the, that's the idea. And, so the farm that we have at Code right now can only grow um, herbs and salad, quite huh? And <laughs> uh, But for the next farm, we are also looking to implement microgreens. So these are the small things on the bottom. And microgreens essentially are small plants that are just 10, seven to 10 days old. And they could be from sunflowers or mustard or something like that. And these are great they're really good in nutritionally and you can put them in smoothies for example and so we're looking to try that out to be able to grow microgreens and then you can make your own smoothie in the office and with that we would have a good mix of plants that need just a short time to grow like the microgreens the salad that need around six weeks to grow and the herbs that basically you never harvest as an entire plant but you just harvest a few leaves and you can use the herbs like basil we have right now in at code and we also have um, I think mint so we, I usually make a tea with the mint when I'm at code and then yeah you have we have this uh, user interface that walks you through the process and really the distinction here is between the office manager and the user the user can just use the farm right planting and harvesting and the admin could be really anyone but we've say it's the office manager, um, could also be the, the student or the intern, the manages the farm, right? So it refills the water, refills the nutrients. And that is only about, let's say an hour a week. Like usually when I do it and there's nothing wrong with the system, it's actually 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And I, our ideal customer is really offices with 10 more people so that they can actually eat all the lettuce that we produce 
and the ability to heat up food. So uh, an office where people really bring their own food as well. Because if people go to the restaurant, yeah, maybe they could have like the microgreens and get a smoothie or have the herbs as well. But ideally, we want to have people that also bring their own lunch. And so now this is so this is this is how actually the, the picture should look like. We have the large scale indoor farms, the small gardens for the home, and we have of course the office farms that are sort of right in between in terms of output of the plant and um, caring yourself for the for the farm. And now to get back to the topic of the talk, um, I mean, really indoor farming for cities, there are a few things that I didn't mention yet. <laughs> so indoor farming sounds great if we look at the water use, sounds great if we look at the land use, um, but ac actually a lot of the indoor farms that are existing today, they are not able to grow staple crops like rice or potatoes, right? So if we look at actually feeding people, like really feeding one, <laughs> and then indoor farms are not there yet. So they they it's just not economically viable right now to, to grow potatoes in an indoor farm. And that's something that needs to happen in order really for indoor farms to take off. And then the second one is, if you don't use green energy for your indoor farm, then what are you doing? Because the, <laughs> the green energy is really the biggest impact, the, the biggest factor for your CO2 footprint of the lettuce. So you could fly a regular lettuce 10 times around the world and you would be still better off with the footprint of that lettuce um, compared to an indoor farming lettuce that was grown without green energy. And of course, like the other factors with land use and water use is still applicable, but it really depends on like what factor you look at in terms of sustainability and when you assess how sustainable an indoor farm is today. Um, and yeah, so right now what's happening is a lot of these indoor farming companies, they really try to focus on crops that have a high value for the people in the city in yeah and, and this is really like strawberry so products that are that have a high dependency on, on uh, seasonality and also products that are really where, where flavor is really a concerning factor so for restaurants they look for getting the, the highest quality of herbs and 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 that's where they focus on right now but really where I see indoor or where I would like to see indoor farming in the future, right? And I'm pretty sure that this will happen at one time or another. Uh, it's really what this picture shows here, which is really like skyscrapers, skyscraper kind of indoor farms in the city, right? So like architecture that is built with the idea in mind that we have plants on the outside of, of, of um, skyscrapers or like we have rings of, of indoor farms on the outside and we have some uh, places to work on the inside. So like a mixture of work, life and, and, and farming in the city. Um, and also this combination of, of urban gardening, because I think the quality of life really increases if you just use real soil and just see a plant grow. Like I, I was taking care of my own God, we, we built a little garden patch in this summer, a friend of mine and, and me. And it was really just like um, these pellets from the construction site put together, put some earth in, and we just had uh, a pumpkin, like uh, and then different different plants. And like, what, what did we get from that? We had like two times, three times, actually something where we could eat something, right? So nothing at all to really feed us. <laughs> in that sense, right? But it was just a lot of fun to take care of it and to see the plant grow and to, to talk about it and to, to share the, the, the journey of that plant. So quality of life, concerning quality of life, I think it's a big factor to, to just be able to grow stuff. And it also makes the city look nicer if we have like small patches of, of land where people grow their own stuff. So I think that would be another code project if I had, didn't have a project. I would ask, go out and ask people um, and, and try to get the city on board to use all these ugly spaces that we have around Berlin and 
basically make sure and, and, and get people that live close to these ugly places and, and provide them with water, provide them with soil if there's no, not enough soil to grow stuff and really just get people to easily grow stuff there on, on their own um, wherever there is space that is not used. Uh, so this is really the opposite side of indoor farming, but more like the community focus. Yeah, so these are uh, my takeaways, and I hope you could also take away something from the talk. And if you have questions, you can ask them now. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you so much, Simon.